Hello everyone, I'm Sam Lemley, Curator of Special Collections at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. Welcome to this third episode of Coffee with the Curator, a video series in which I share some of the many fascinating objects, artifacts, and books held in CMU's special collections. Uh, so today's episode is actually pre-recorded uh, and broadcast as part of an event that was sponsored by the CMU Alumni Association, and it was fil filmed on the fifth floor of Hunt Library. Uh, in the Hunt Institute for Botanical Documentation. And I'd like to go ahead and just uh, open by thanking the Institute and its director, in particular, Terry Jacobson, uh, for hosting us uh, for filming this event. Um, I'll link to the full event, which features more objects uh, in, in the video script description below. Uh, and I think in our next episode, episode four, uh, I'll be back sharing something directly into the camera with you. So thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoy uh, and more soon. Thanks. The first thing that I want to share with you tonight is this book. It's a single volume of a scholarly journal that was published by the Berlin Academy of Sciences in 1710. Um, and for those of us that are familiar with the way that publishing works in academia, the idea of a scholarly journal will be somewhat familiar. But at the time, in 1710, this was an incredibly new and groundbreaking genre. And I think that the real advantage of this form is that it passed the cost of publication uh, from the author, from the printer, off to annual subscribers to the particular journal. And what that meant is that um, scientists, in particular mathematicians, um, but also archaeologists, linguists, really anyone working in sort of um, niche fields, uh, were able to publish very short form discoveries um, and quickly, right? These were sometimes issued monthly. So um, I think you really can't overestimate the impact that this genre had on the history of science uh, and its advancement, its rapid advancement, particularly in the, the 17th and 18th centuries. So in this particular volume, there's a very short article by the German mathematician Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Um, and this article is titled Brevis Descriptio Machinae Arithmeticae, or A Brief Description of an Arithmetic Machine. Um, and you can see that this is something uh, that Leibniz is describing and announcing. In the first line, he says um, he invented it in his adolescence, right, mad or rather modestly, um, and in 1673. Uh, but that's interesting in itself, right? So it's only published in 1710, decades later. That's an indication of the amount of um, refining that Leibniz had to do on this machine that he's describing. Um, this is the first published account with an illustration of a mechanical computer. Uh, and Leibniz was uh, sort of, his design was groundbreaking in a number of ways, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. So. Um, what is this machine? Uh, well, if we turn to an accompanying illustration um, at the back of the book, there it is, right? So it's kind of an odd looking thing. It's in a wooden box um, with a handle, some hinges. Um, there are these small windows at the top, um, dials here, and then this sort of hand crank. Um, so you probably can see that we have something right next to me on the table here resembling this illustration. And in fact, um, this is a replica uh, of Leibniz's uh, 17th century um, calculating machine. Um, this particular model was built by an Italian model maker, Roberto Guatelli, uh, in the middle of last century. And it came to CMU with the Traub McCordick collection just a couple years ago. Um, so you can see a little bit in a little bit more detail what's going on with this machine. Unfortunately, we can't take the casing off to show the, the, the sort of intricacies of its mechanics, um, but you can kind of get a sense of how it would be operated. So there again, on the top, up, upper edge, there are these 16 windows, and that's where the solution would appear. So you could calculate um, a solution up to 16 digits. Um, and then there's a small, another small a line of small windows here where you enter um, the digits you're going to be calculating with, right? Um, so Leibniz's machine wasn't entirely groundbreaking. There were actually earlier mechanical calculators much like this, um, probably most famously the one that Blaise Pascal invented and designed um, a couple decades before Leibniz's worked at, Leibniz worked on his. Um, but significantly, Pascal's 
um, only did addition and subtraction, right? Um, Leibniz found a way to build a machine that was capable of all four arithmetic operations, right? Subtraction, addition, multiplication, and division. Um, so you can imagine just the, the, the complexity of engineering uh, and also the skill of the people actually tasked with building this thing. Um, it's, it's a monument uh, of engineering and mechanics. Um, so, you know, this is, I think I, I'm starting with this, uh, these, this pair of objects because it kind of encapsulates what I think we want to accomplish in special collections at CMU. You know, we're really interested in telling the history of computing over the long durée, right? Sort of from the 17th century when you sort of get these early experiments in mechanical calculation all the way through, you know, mid-century pioneers like Alan Turing, Grace Hopper, uh, von Neumann, et cetera. Uh, these are all names I'm sure this audience will recognize. So, but what is the genealogy, right, between, through and between those centuries? And how can we represent that genealogy and that history in the form of a collection? Um, so that's, that's, that's the main reason why I wanted to start with these two artifacts from Leibniz. The other reason is, you know, insofar as a discipline can be said to originate in one individual, I think um, the history of computer science um, arguably could be said to originate in Leibniz uh, and his immediate circle. Um, because he was not only working on the design and, and, and sort of operation of mechanical computers, calculators, he also developed a system of symbolic logic. Um, and probably most famously, he developed um, the system of binary code, one and zero, uh, that influenced uh, modern binary code that's still used today. So, you know, he's working on these sort of three strands of thought, right? Symbolic logic, binary code, and um, you know, mechanically assisted computing that are still with us, are still with us in the, in the history of computer science, you know, just across campus too. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll just gonna, as a brief aside, um, something else, another treasure in the collection that we have of Leibniz's is a first edition of his Nova Methodus, which is his calculus, um, right? So Leibniz is probably most well known for his invention independently of Newton of the calculus. So this is, this is the first appearance in print of the calculus, 1684. Um, and again, this is in um, an, an annual volume of another scholarly journal called the Acta Erudatorum. Uh, it was published in Leipzig. So very, very common for Leibniz to publish in this form. Um, he published hundreds of articles like this over the course of his career. Um, and this just gives you a sense of the, the range of activity right, that, that he was up to um, over the course of his life. With this next object, we jump forward in time, three and a half centuries, to another very familiar name in the history of computer science, and that's Alan Turing. So this is a, a volume of the academic journal, another scholarly publication, uh, Mind, which uh, specialized in human psychology, which might strike us as odd. Alan Turing is obviously dealing with um, computer and machine intelligence, not human intelligence, but he saw a close connection there. Um, so this is volume 59. It was published in 1950. Um, and I'll turn to Turing's article now. So the name, the title of the article is Computing Machinery and Intelligence. Um, and this was an incredibly groundbreaking event um, in sort of the history of the theory of artificial intelligence. It's where uh, Alan Turing first described what became known as the Turing test, but what he called the imitation game. Um, and that's just a sort of thought experiment um, in which you know you test a computer for a human standard of intelligence. Of course, famously, we have still not built um, a machine that reaches that standard. Um, so, Turing in this article, of course, introduces that concept, that standard, um, and it was kind of groundbreaking because before this, um, the idea of a computer intelligence, machine intelligence, was a bit vague. Right? No one knew how exactly to determine whether a machine, whether a computer was in fact intelligent. So he sort of wandered into this debate and came up with a fairly brilliant way of determining this kind of controversial question. But I, I think what makes this article really significant is actually the second idea that you find um, in its pages. And I'll turn to um, a subsection of the article, um, which Turing gives the title learning machines, right? 
So you can see there, Section 7, Learning Machines. So again, before this article, it was assumed that you know, machines could only do what they were told to do, right? And that was it. Uh, machines, Turing says, were often thought to never be able to surprise human beings. Um, of course, he responds by saying, actually, machines surprise me all the time. Uh, and he has this really enduring view of the potential to actually program a machine, a computer, to behave in a way that was similar to the child's mind, right? So this was hugely groundbreaking. Um, the assumption had long been, been, you know, let's program a computer to resemble an adult mind. But what Turing said was, no, let's, let's consider a heuristic model for um, programming a machine that might attain artificial intelligence so that we could actually teach the machine through sort of, um, you know, question and response uh, interactions rather than trying to sort of anticipate every possible scenario and program for every possible scenario. So it's like I, I use the word endearing because um, I, I really like Turing's later papers, his later scholarship for this sort of boundless optimism that they show. You know, after his academic work, uh, first at Cambridge and then at Princeton and then his wartime service, of course, at Bletchley Park, um, in the cryptanalytic unit, uh, which we'll actually be seeing at uh, uh, Enigma Machine in just a moment. So after that sort of official um, work and academic work, he, he joins the University of Manchester. Um, and a lot of his work in this period, in the early 50s, um, right before he dies, um, is, is much more speculative and imaginative. And I think this article is a perfect example of that imaginative range that Turing was capable of. And literary style, he writes in a really engaging way. One thing that I really like about this article is the way that it ends. So I'm going to turn to that line. And he writes, um, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. Right? So again, this sort of sense of boundless optimism um, and you know, applying our imagination to these fairly technical problems. You know, if we do that, if we accomplish that sort of imaginative element in this work, um, really we can sort of find out amazing things. Um, so, you know, there's also a tragic element to this story um, because, you know, of course, four years after the publication of this article, Alan Turing would die by suicide uh, after being convicted by the British government for a gross indecency, basically being prosecuted for his homosexuality. Um, and he was forced to undergo a regime of um, chemical castration, essentially. So just terrible end to a brilliant life and the loss uh, is somewhat incalculable. You know, what, what would he have contributed had he been given another 50 years of life? Um, we just can't know. Another reason why I'm sharing this book is I often get the question, you know, what makes a rare book rare? And I think this is an example of a book that might not look the part, uh, but is rare uh, for a variety of reasons. You know, we tend to assume, you know, a rare book is not only valuable uh, and significant in history, um, but it looks good. Um, and as, as you can see with this one, it's not a very good looking copy of this book. Um, you know, there are library stamps on the edge. This is in sort of a basic library, what's called a buckram binding. Um, and there are actually pieces of tape holding pages of Turing's article together. Um, so, you know, and there, there are copies out there on, in the antiquarian book market that come up at auction that are in pristine condition that have the original binding. But you know, I kind of like that this copy is a bit beat up because this is CMU's copy. Right? As recently as two months ago, this copy was in circulation. Uh, CMU students could come in and check it out. Um, so, and, and that's sort of an, an ongoing project in special collections um, in the libraries here. It's something that we've been able to do during quarantine, but we're sort of methodically going through the catalog and looking for important articles in the history of computer science. Uh, much much like this one, um, Turing's here, you know, articles by people like John von Neumann, Claude Shannon, Grace Hopper, right? These sort of pioneers that are contemporaries of Turing, uh, and we're identifying those as culturally significant, um, particularly in this story that we're trying to tell about the history of computing, and we're moving them to special collections, right? So that we have, you know, an original um, copy, of, you know, the the material artifact of the the, the origination of that idea. Um, contained in them, um, but you know, and there's also the there's also the aura of provenance in this particular copy, um, which I can wax poetic about. 
um, you know, this was the copy of Turing's um, Computing Machinery and Intelligence that was in circulation when Herb Simon uh, was working right here. So, you know, it has it has the history of place right in it, and um, for that reason, you know, I, I don't particularly care that it's beat up. It's it's CMU's copy. Um, so that's that's a, just an example of how, you know, books, despite condition, uh, despite appearance, can become rare, right? Particularly as the ideas they contain kind of transcend to cultural relevance and importance, uh, and that's certainly true of Turing's book here. So next, as promised, um, these are probably the most well-known objects in the collection, if not the most immediately recognizable, at least when their cases are closed. These are two Enigma machines. Um, they're, they're cipher devices used most famously or infamously by the Nazi military in World War II. Um, and we have a uh, three-rotor model, and that'll make sense when I open them up, and a four-rotor model. And I want to start with them closed because you can see the original serial numbers at the back of the boxes here and here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll turn them around carefully. You can see that they're encased in these sort of oak veneer um, boxes um, that have handles on them so that they would have been you know, portable in, in field service. Um, and then on the backs there are these metal latches which open and then very gently there we are. So I'll move that one there. That's the three rotor model. You can see the three rotors and this one is the four rotor. This one, carefully set that down there. So these are of course famous objects. Um, they have a very dark history naturally being used by the Nazis, um, but they're also relevant to the collections we're building, um, not least because Alan Turing, whom we just met, uh, worked on deciphering uh, the Enigma code at Bletchley Park during World War II. So the Enigmas were or the Enigma machine was originally invented by a man named Arthur Scurbius, who was a German inventor in the 1920s. Uh, and the original object of the Enigma machine was actually to disguise commercial secrets, right, business secrets. Um, so that's who they were sold to initially. Um, but the German military, of course, very quickly uh, recognized um, the security that they provided in um, secret communications and co-opted the technology, um, refined it, developed it further, uh, and both of these are examples of the later sort of 1930s, 1940s era enigmas um, that have these sort of plug boards at the front. I'll gently fold this down, All right? Um, so I mentioned that this is the three rotor model. Um, it's the earlier of the two uh, and primarily used by the German um, army uh, and also the Air Force. Um, so, you know, again, this is kind of like Leibniz's calculator earlier and that you really can't see uh, the mechanical complexity of the device uh, without removing the case. Um, but it's electromechanical, it was powered by a battery. And you know, very, ba very basically, uh, when you press one of its typewriter-like keys, uh, you initiate an electrical current, which passes through a secret um, you know, electrical route uh, to one of these windows, um, each one showing a letter, and that window would light up. Right? And also, every time you pressed one of its keys, um, the leftmost rotor would advance one step. Right? And then once you got through all positions of the leftmost rotor, this one would then move forward once, kind of like uh, an odometer on an old car. Right? Um, but what that meant is that once you set up you know, the three rotors in the initial position, right, with every press of a key, the settings would change. Right? So that if I were to, exam for example, press E three times, each of those three times it would be assigned another um, cipher character to hide it. Right? So that's what made it almost unbreakable, right? because basically the settings of the cipher would change with every single character of, of what the plain text entered in to become the cipher text. Um, but that wasn't enough right, for the German Navy. And so the four rotor model was developed, which basically added, again, another rotor, another level of complexity um, to the cipher system. Uh, and the reason why the Navy, the German Navy, the Nazi Navy, um, developed the four rotor model was to protect um, communications regarding its very important U-boat fleet. Um, 
and you know, if you if you look at these, one thing I really like about the two enigmas we have, this one is in impeccable condition. You almost wonder if it ever saw a service in the field, whereas this one is a little bit beat up. It's the, the metal components are more rusty. Um, the sort of uh, finish on the casing is kind of worn away. It has this patina, uh, and I like to think that. That's because it was exposed to sort of the salt air of, you know, its naval commission. You know, I don't know, but, um, but I like to think. But so these are naturally incredibly rare um, objects. Um, you know, the Nazi people, soldiers in the Nazi, Nazi military were required to destroy the Enigma machine if they were ever captured or at risk of imminent capture. Um, so the fact that these survive, um, you know, is kind of an accident of history. Um, I think there are about 350 um, surviving um, examples of the three-rotor model and about half that number of the four-rotor model, which is far rarer. Um, so these uh, are in the Traub McCordick collection. Um, we're incredibly lucky to have them, uh, and already they've um, kind of made possible really interesting educational uh, programs. Uh, in fact, students, graduate students, uh, came uh, into Special Collections about a year ago, year and a half ago, and took these apart, right, to actually look at how they're put together. Um, and that was um, an initiative, a program uh, sponsored by the HOST uh, program, the History of Science and Technology Group at CMU. Um, so th there's, there's huge potential here, right, that you can learn. It, people studying, you know, um, block ciphers or, you know, advanced encryption methods, it kind of starts here, right, the history of cryptology. Um, and these join a number of books in the history of, of cryptography and cryptology. Um, and so we're sort of, we're, this is sort of a side, a side branch of this, this um, history of computing collection that we're, we're starting to develop. Uh, we have several things in the history of cryptography in addition to things in the history of computing. And of course, those two fields are kind of inextricably linked. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll just end by saying that it's, there's again that aura um, uh, having these shelved nearby works by Alan Turing, um, you kind of have that history, that relationship that he had with, with these very dark machines, um, kind of at the height of his career, encapsulated in the form of a collection on shelves. So this last thing that I'll share is actually a new acquisition. It's something that we purchased for the collection um, just last month, uh, and it arrived just last week. Um, so this is actually the first uh, printed book on the subject of robotics. Uh, it was published uh, in Venice in 1589, so it's quite an old thing. And I, I love the title. So this is a, a, it's an Italian translation of a classical work by Hero of Alexandria on uh, mechanics and automata, which are sort of early robots. Um, but the Italian translation, I think, is, of the title is really wonderful. It's um, on automatons or machines that move themselves, right? Which is, I think, a brilliant um, definition, uh, if you will, of ro robots. Um, so, you know, there was, there was a 17th century and late 16th century fascination with robots and automata. They're sort of, you know, advanced puppets in a way. But uh, again, you know, as I was talking uh, earlier about the sort of genealogy of the history of computing, you know, there's a, there's a comparable genealogy in the history of robotics. Um, and this gives me an opportunity to call out my um, really brilliant colleagues in the university archives uh, who are currently working on putting together uh, a robot archive, right? A sort of archive of CMU's work and innovation in innovations in robotics and the story of robotics sort of from a more contemporary lens. Um, so, you know, I, I view it as special collections role to tell the prehistory uh, of that story. Um, and I think I would argue that that prehistory really starts here with this book uh, and the sort of uh, reception of classical mechanics and the sort of effort by Renaissance scientists to build machines um, that do things. Um, like robots might do today. Um, so I'll give you one example uh, with an illustration here, uh, which I just, I really like. Um, it's, an, it's an image of a machine that cuts wood automatically, right? So you have this sort of awkward um, apparatus, uh, the gear with these sort of sharp teeth and these two weights, uh, which actually power the machine. Um, the idea being, you know, I'm, I'm not sure this actually worked, but and the idea being, can we construct an automata that would be capable of doing something that might be viewed as difficult by, by humans, right? Cutting wood or something comparable. <laughs>